It's great to be here live from the CMHC meeting in Boston. I'm Pam Taub. I'm a cardiologist and professor of medicine at UC San Diego, and it's great to be here with Dr. Singh. Great. Thanks, Pam. Um, my name is Ajay Singh. I'm uh, a nephrologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Senior Associate Dean for Postgraduate Medical Education at Harvard Medical School. And I want to talk about our session that we just had on cardiorenal at the CMHC conference. We talked about a lot of really important concepts. First of all, it's really great as a cardiologist, a nephrologist, to be coming together to be talking about our systems and how our systems are closely and intricately linked. And there's so many new therapies that we have that address both cardiac risk and uh, re renal risk. So some of the things that we talked about are some of the newer drugs. Can you tell us about what you're excited about? Well, firstly, I'm, I'm really excited um, about the continued recognition that really the heart and the kidney uh, play in the same sandbox together. That uh, patients with acute cardiac uh, injury and cardiac dysfunction uh, have renal consequences uh, and real renal outcomes. And that patients with kidney failure have real cardiac uh, uh, outcomes. And this interplay between the two uh, systems really accounts for a significant amount of morbidity and mortality in patients that we all see, not only cardiovascular medicine, uh, nephrology, uh, but also endocrinology and uh, primary care. So one of the things that's been really eye-opening to me as a cardiologist is I'm starting to do things that I never learned about in fellowship. For instance, I look for microalbuminuria in my patients, really because of the incredible amount of data that we have from the SGLT2 inhibitor trials and now with the non-steroidal MRA finerenone. But all of these trials have really emphasized we need to look beyond just EGFR and creatinine and really look for microalbuminuria and to look at these things together. And so as a cardiologist, this is something new that I'm doing. Absolutely. Um, I think one of the biggest advances uh, in thinking about uh, the diagnosis of kidney disease at an early stage and its screening was the recognition that we could predict kidney function using an equation so that uh, rather than just using serum creatinine, which would miss a fair amount of the game, as it were, um, you calculated uh, estimated G GFR or GFR. And that allowed us to develop stages of kidney disease. But that wasn't enough in uh, predicting risk. And it became increasingly recognized that detection of albumin in the urine urine albumin ratios, UACR, um, was a very powerful predictor of not only renal risk, kidney risk of progression, but also cardiovascular risk. Uh, and so when you take these two important factors and you combine them and you put them on a kidney map, a heat map, if you will, you're able to place patients into risk categories that allow you to predict the risk of cardiac complications in patients with kidney disease, but also renal or kidney complications uh, in patients. The other thing I, th I think that's important to recognize is that the mortality and morbidity of patients um, is increased if they have kidney disease, it's increased if they have cardiac disease, but there's a multiplicator effect if they have both cardiac disease and kidney disease there together. And central to this is the measurement of EGFR and UACR, at least from the nephrology perspective, and I'm taking a very nephrological perspective to this. Yeah, I think one of the things that in general that cardiologists are starting to become more aware of is how even small changes in EGFR uh, can be associated with increased cardiovascular risk. I remember in my training, uh, we would see an EGFR of 55 and we would, in an older patient, and we'd say, oh, that's age-related decline in renal function and not think too much about it. But our thinking has really evolved greatly because now we realize that even a mild decrease in EGFR, le less than 60, is associated with elevated cardiovascular risk. And we've even incorporated that into our decision-making about who gets 
statin therapy. So it's in, in our guidelines. So I think we've come a long way from just dismissing mild decreases in EGFR to recognizing how important it is. Yeah, absolutely agree with you, Pam. Uh, it is no more important than in the area of type 2 diabetes. Uh, in uh, coinciding with the American Diabetes Association meetings in uh, this past June uh, and uh, in, with a series of articles in The Lancet, um, an editorial named diabetes as the disease of the century, that there will be uh, over one billion people with diabetes in the world um, uh, in the next uh, 15 to 20 years. Among patients with type 2 diabetes, it's recognized that kidney disease and cardiovascular disease are really important. And I think the main reason why we're focusing on uh, early detection is because by recognizing these patients early, we're able to implement therapy much earlier. Long gone are the days where it was just acceptable or it's acceptable to place patients on uh, renin angiotensin blockade alone. Nowadays, uh, pillars of therapy are, are being advocated, whether it's in the cardiovascular guidelines, the diabetes guidelines, or the, or the kidney guidelines. And so we're looking at um, RAS inhibitors or renal angiotensin uh, inhibitors. We're looking at SGLT2 inhibitors. We're looking at mineralocorticoid receptor inhibitors. And then the new block, on the, uh, the new kid on the block are GLP uh, RAs, which, which really uh, taken together, all four of them, uh, are likely to have profound beneficial effects on patients with type 2 diabetes who have both kidney disease and uh, cardiovascular disease. And in these patients, detection is uh, early is important. Indeed, in a paper that was published just this past week in JAMA Cardiology, uh, my colleague Rajiv Agarwal uh, dem uh, demonstrated that if you, using a simulation uh, of NHANES, the NHANES data set, if you treat these patients with these pillars of therapy, including non-steroidal mineralocorticoid inhibitors, that you will probably save about 38,000 cardiovascular events in patients with early kidney disease. So you will reduce that many events if that is played out uh, uh, in these patients. So there's likely to be meaningful benefit of early detection and use of multiple therapies uh, in our patients uh, to try and mitigate both cardiovascular and kidney risk. Yeah, what's I think really amazing is we have multiple agents now that we can actually utilize to decrease the progression of chronic kidney disease. And one of the most exciting things recently that was announced was the FLOW study with the GLP-1 receptor agonist was positive and stopped early. So now we're going to have an, a completely new class of drugs that are eventually going to be indicated for progress, to prevent progression of chronic kidney disease. And so I think one of the most important takeaways from our session is not only do we need to detect kidney disease, but we need to detect it early and also institute the right therapies to prevent progression because really nobody should be getting dialysis if we do our job right. Right, absolutely. And, and you know, the other interesting thing is that, um, you know, we uh, as nephrologists, and I would uh, hasten to add probably internists and uh, uh, diabetologists, um, admire uh, your profession, kind of vascular medicine, where the heart failure specialists have got it right. They don't hesitate to place patients on multiple agents. Uh, four agents for the treatment of heart failure is not controversial. It's part of the guidelines. We, on the other hand, still hesitate, right? We're still thinking about, let's place a patient first on a RAS inhibitor, then let's think about an SGLT2, or let's think about uh, a myrhydocortical receptor antagonist or um, uh, uh, other agents, newer agents like uh, um, uh, semaglutide. But I think the important issue is the recognition that first you can detect patients early, so you've got to do the UACR. Note, only about 50% of patients who should be having UACR checked are having UACR checked, so there's a gap there. Second, among those patients who have risk of progression and of cardiovascular complication, only about 15% of those patients are receiving an SGLT2 inhibitor, and even a fraction of those receiving a non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. So we have a long way to go 
to try and get our patients on optimal therapy, guideline-directed medical therapy, to try and mitigate risk of cardiovascular and uh, kidney complications. Well, that was a great dialogue on how our fields are evolving, and you will see a lot of this kind of crosstalk at the Cardiometabolic Health Congress.